So last week, Pastor Bob taught on principles to hear God's voice, part six. And just to recap a little bit, you know, from Genesis to Revelation, we see examples of God communicating with people. And our Christian experience should be understood from that perspective that God sent his son, Jesus, to restore us to himself in every way. And that includes normal, open communication, just like what Adam and Eve experienced in the garden before the fall. Unfortunately, many make the mistake of treating Christianity just as a, a set of beliefs, you know, rules to live by. It's just a book, right? And we ignore the life of the Spirit that the Bible clearly reveals to us. So Pastor Bob shared last week from Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 5 to 12. I'm not going to read it all, but, it's, but the key was, what do you see? So Jeremiah, uh, God called Jeremiah, and Jeremiah heard, and yet he doubted. You got the wrong guy, God? But God continued to reveal things to Jeremiah, to show him, no, no, I got this right, Jeremiah. You just need to, you know, you just, you got to get this, because I got this right, and I've called you. And Jeremiah, yes, you can hear my voice. And the passage demonstrates this connection between Jeremiah's ability to see, his ability to have faith, and his ability to act on what God had revealed to him. And, and through this, Jeremiah fulfilled God's will, God's purpose in his life. So hearing God's voice moves us in purpose and towards our destiny. God's revelation opens up new realms of living, of possibility, and of faith. It's impossible. Everyone say impossible. It's impossible to live a powerful, normal Christian life without receiving regular revelation from God. You know, David prevailed against Goliath because he understood God's nature and he understood God's word over his life, over David's life. So this week... Pastor Bob actually asked me to continue with his series, actually, The Principles to Hear God's Voice. So this is going to be part seven. And more specifically, this morning, we're going to look at four keys to hearing God's voice. And I hope this will give us some practical tools that we can use, right, to develop our ability to hear and to understand God's voice. Some of you may be familiar with Dr. Mark Berkler. So Mark, was he was a pastor, and he was discouraged. He was thinking about quitting, you know, quitting the ministry. He believed that the gifts of the Spirit were dead, that they'd ceased to operate in the church when the canon of Scripture, you know, when the Bible was completed. And you know what? His experience lined up perfectly with his wrong beliefs, right? Somehow, though, he was hoping there was more to the story, right? And, and of course, we're glad that any time we can, there's got to be more to the story. Thankfully, God was gracious enough to demonstrate to Mark that God is still speaking to his people today. God's never stopped speaking. And, and from a passage in Habakkuk, God showed Verkler four keys to hearing God's voice. And that's what this message is based on this morning. So let's start by looking at, uh, looking at our text. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. It says, I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the lookout tower. I will watch to see what he will say to me, and what I should reply about my complaint. The Lord answered me, write down this vision, clearly inscribe it on tablets so one may easily read it. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It testifies about the end and will not lie. Though it delays, wait for it, since it will certainly come and not be late. Look, his ego is inflated, he is without integrity, but the righteous one will live by his faith. So from this scripture, God started to show Dr. Verkler these four keys. 
Habakkuk was looking for new vision as he prayed. I will watch to see, right? I want to see something new. I want to see what's going on. Verkler said he was seeking a spiritual experience. Habakkuk was determined to set aside his own thoughts, to look into the spirit world, to see what God wanted to show him. Of course, today that would seem a little weird, unusual, and even out of the kingdom. But this is a central biblical teaching. It's part of true biblical experience. So remember Acts chapter 2, verse 17. It says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. All people, it said there. We should expect God to reveal or communicate to us today. So key number one. He called it stillness. Quiet yourself so you can hear God's voice. Amen. So I must learn to still my own thoughts and emotions so that I can sense God's flow of thoughts, impressions, visions within me. Back to Habakkuk 2.1, it says, I will stand in the guard post and station myself on the rampart. So Habakkuk knew that in order to hear and see God's spontaneous thoughts and visions, he had to go to a quiet place and still his thoughts, right? The guard post, that's not where the party is, Right? The party's down there, but he's up on the wall. You can imagine it's dark, it's nighttime, it's quiet. Maybe in the distance you can hear the party, right? But he's not at the party because he wants to hear. He wants to hear what God is saying. Psalm 46, verse 10 encourages us to be still and know that he is God. There's a deeper inner knowing, that spontaneous flow, and I'm gonna, you're going to hear that a hundred times this morning. The spontaneous flow in our spirits that each one of us can experience when we quiet our flesh and our minds to hear God speaking to us. Now, you know, we're barely at step one, and already this is a tough one for me. Because, you know, when I was a little kid, I, I read a lot, and I would lose myself in stories, and then... I would, I would spend hours, I guess I spent too much time by myself, I would spend hours just imagining stories in my mind. And, you know, for example, one of the churches we went to, it, down, the, down the whole side of the sanctuary had floor-to-ceiling windows. I mean, it was, it was really neat. Now, if I were building a church... I don't think I'd put floor-to-ceiling windows because that's too big a temptation. Because my mind, now I'm a kid, right? But my mind, I'm sitting there and the pastor's speaking, but I'm out that window. There's a high-rise apartment across the street and I'm climbing up the railings and I'm shooting bad guys and I'm jumping off and I'm doing all these things in my mind, right? Of course, I'm very quiet because the pastor is speaking. But I'm not... I'm in my mind, you know, out somewhere else, right? <coughs> oh, sorry, can't do that. <clears throat> Did you catch that? I coughed, right? Okay, all right. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> my imagination had a field day during the sermon. <laughs> See, I practiced hearing and developing my thoughts. Now, in my defense, I didn't know I should be listening for God th- God's thoughts at that time. But, you know, ignorance does not make it okay, right? I practice my own thoughts. You've heard that expression, practice makes perfect, right? You know, that's not really true. And I, another musician years ago told me, no, Glenn, Glenn, that's not true. Practice makes permanent, What you practice, you're going to get really good at. And if you're doing it wrong, you're going to get really good at doing it wrong. Right? So what do you practice? So let's look at some practice, some good practice, to quiet the noise, to quiet our own thoughts, to prepare ourselves to pick up on God's spontaneous flow. First thing, worship. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 15, 
Jehoshaphat, is, he's called for the prophet of the Lord. And so Elisha comes. The first thing Elisha says after hearing what's going on, he says, bring me a harpist. Dude, we need to worship a bit before we get into this, right? Starts with worship. Worship helps tune our spirit to God. And as we become still, our thoughts, our will, and emotions, as we wait before God, his divine flow can begin. So we can use worship to quiet ourselves before the Lord, open ourselves to God's flow. We can pray in tongues. Anyone been in that place where your mind is just all over the place and you start praying in tongues? And what happens? It starts to overwhelm your thoughts that are rambling on this, that, whatever it is. And you start praying in tongues and it can start to overcome. It starts to beat down that flow of your own your own mind. So prayer in the Spirit helps quiet our thoughts. Sometimes, for me anyways, my mind will uh, start running through a list of things I need to do. You know, oh God, I'm so glad to be in your presence. You know what? I forgot to fix that um, that door there. Oh, I need milk. Write it down. Just have a little notepad. Write it down. Okay, milk. And then set that aside and get back to what you're doing, right? Get back to your prayer. For me, I'll be in a prayer meeting and you know, we're supposed to be, oh God, you're so good. And it could be that and the, often what happens is there's a problem that I've been working on, right? Maybe I've been working on a project and I'm just, oh, I don't know how to do this. How am I going to accomplish this? I get into a prayer meeting. Now, I'm not thinking. I'm actually not thinking about that, that problem, okay? I'm here to pray. I actually, I've, I've done this right. I'm here to pray. God, you're so good. The answer to that problem comes to my mind. What do I do? I write it down or I get my phone out and, you know, type it down, whatever. I write it down and then I get back into what I'm there for, right? <clears throat> the next thing here, if the Holy Spirit reminds you of an area of sin, uh, an attitude or, or an offense, we need to confess. We need to repent. We need to put that all under the blood of Christ. And then get back to our prayer. If we're holding offense, unforgiveness, judgment, these things can greatly hinder our ability to hear God. So we want to we release those things, put them at the cross. Fix your gaze upon Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2, it says, looking away from all that will distract us and focusing our eyes on Jesus. We need to become quiet in his presence and share with him what is on our heart. Let that two-way communication begin to flow. It's just, it's so important to become still and focused if we're going to receive the pure Word of God. Years ago, I heard another teacher describe it as centering in, right? You can, you can imagine even, uh, uh, you know, you've, you've seen those new flashlights, right, where you can, and the beam goes from here, and suddenly, what happens when the beam gets small? You can see much farther. Have you ever, you ever noticed that? Right, if I'm in the backyard with my dogs, yeah, I can see five feet, but then... Ooh, I can see 35 feet down there or more, right? So, centering in. Because <clears throat> when, you know, when we're not centered in, we start to hear, we mean, we'll still be having thoughts, we'll still be hearing things, and some of it may be God, but there's our own thoughts, and now everything's all mixed up, right? So we want to try to center in on God like that. All right. So, so uh, key number two is getting quiet. Key number three, vision. Look for vision as you pray. As you pray, fix the eyes of your heart upon Jesus and expect, everyone say expect. Yeah. Expect to hear and see in the Spirit the thoughts, impressions, dreams, visions of God. Back to our text in Habakkuk 2. He's, Habakkuk said, I will keep watch to see. And God said... We can stop right there. And God said, right? God replied. God said, record the vision. It's interesting that Habakkuk purposed to look for vision as he prayed. He was going to open the eyes of his heart, look into the spirit realm, 
see what God wanted to show him. You should expect, say expect again, you should expect encounters with the Lord as you pray, as you, as you get into his presence. You know, on, on the worship team up here, we often talk about worship with expectation. We don't want it to be just, you know, a song service. That's not, that's not what we're trying to accomplish here. We worship with expectation. We mostly never actually know what God does out there when we're leading worship up here. But I always remember a couple great examples. You know, one time, we, were, we, had, we did a, actually worship had just ended, okay? And a lady, she was sitting over there, and she, she was just visiting. I, I don't know who, no one knew who she was. You know who she was, never seen where she came from. She comes running up the side, up to the front, and she's saying, I don't know what you guys were doing when you were singing those songs, but... And she went on to describe how she, had, when she'd come in, she had terrible pain. I think it was down her leg. She had all this pain. No one prayed for her. She had no idea that God could heal anything. So she didn't ask, oh God, while we sing this song, please come and touch me. No, she didn't do that. She just, oh wow, that's an interesting song. Oh, it's about Jesus. Whoop! Hey, what happened? And she's totally healed. We worship with expectation. There's another time, and I'm, and I'm taking a lot of time here, but there's another time, there's an altar call, and people come up to the front, and there was supposed to be someone come up and pray with them for each one. I forgot why. Well, I don't remember what we were even praying for, but a lady came up here, standing right up here, and there was no, no one came up. No ministry team person came. She's standing there by herself. She's supposed to have someone praying for whatever this particular issue was. And I just turned to the team and said, listen, that one's ours. We're going to pray for that one. And so just as we, as we worshiped, and we weren't playing a particular song or anything, we were just, we were background music, if you will. And we just started directing our worship at this person. And you know what happened? <laughs> one of the catchers, one of the ushers, got there like one second before she fell in the spirit. No one prayed for it, and no one up the don't, no prayer team prayed for her. See, we worship with expectation, and we come to God with expectation. Ephesians 1.18 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints. God gave you eyes in your heart to see in the Spirit, to see the vision and movement of Almighty God. You know, the most, the most obvious prerequisite to seeing is that we need to look, right? Right? We have to look. We, you know, we won't see anything if we're not looking for anything. Right? In Daniel chapter 7, Jan, Daniel's seeing a vision in his mind and he's saying, I was looking. I looked. I looked again. And he's describing and writing it down. He's describing what God is showing him as he looked into the spirit realm. You ever been to an art gallery? And maybe you've gazed in some really intricate painting, right? And you're saying, oh, wow, that is, oh, that is so beautiful. And your eye catches something in the other side of the painting. Oh, my goodness, look how they did that bird over there, right? right? And you see, you're, as you're looking, you're seeing all these different things. Okay, anyone remember reading Richard's scary books when they were kids? I, okay, uh, just a handful. Well, you handful... Well, remember, those were amazing, weren't they? they had, there was not a white piece. There was no white space in these. There was something going on in every little fort. It's like, oh, my God. As a kid, it was amazing. Those books were astounding, right? But you had to look. You had to look to see it. So as you pray, look for Jesus to be with you. 
watch to see him speak to you. And many Christians find if they can only look with expectation, they'll begin to see, they'll begin to hear the voice of God. God with us, right? Jesus is Emmanuel. Now you may discover that discerning God's voice comes so easily to you that you think this can't be God. Right? Some of you may experience that. God, I want to hear your voice. Here I am. No, that was too easy. That couldn't have been God. That must, that, that must have been my mind doing that, right? Doubt is one of the enemy's biggest tools, right? So don't, so don't, don't doubt. Judge it. You know what? You sense that God is telling you, you know, go pray for that person. Well, let's start by saying, okay, does that line up with Scripture? Maybe I was hearing God. I think that does line up with Scripture. Go have an ice cream. Ah, that might not have been the Holy Spirit right there. <sighs> i got to stop listening to that voice. We continue to press in and doubt gets replaced by faith as we realize that these thoughts and visions can only be God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says, So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. Jesus listened for the Father's voice and based his actions on what he heard. And at Jesus' death, that temple, what happened to, uh, the, in the temple, the curtain in the temple, what happened to that? The veil was torn right from top to bottom. And no longer was that inner sanctuary, that place of the presence of God, was no longer reserved just for the priests. Right? You can go there. I can go there. That, that curtain is gone. The veil is gone. And we have access to the very presence of God. I think today, maybe more than ever, Christians need to learn how to quiet that noise, set their eyes on Jesus, and expect to hear God's voice. Key number three is spontaneity. Recognize God's voice as spontaneous thoughts that light upon your mind. So God's voice in our hearts can often, maybe usually, flow like a bunch of just supernatural, spontaneous thoughts. So when we tune into God, we tune into spontaneity. Habakkuk 2.2, 2, the Lord answered me and said, see Habakkuk, he learned the sound of God's voice. He learned what it sounded like. Elijah described it as a still small voice. And, you know, many, many Christians maybe listen for that audible voice to say, Glenn, this is God. And, and uh, uh, that can happen, of course. But for most of us, that's not how God's going to speak to us, right? For most of us, most of the time, God's voice comes to us as spontaneous thoughts, visions, feelings, or impressions. An example might be you're driving down the road and the thought comes to you to pray for a certain person. That's God's voice calling you to pray. And we had just used that example, didn't I? The question to you is, what did that voice, what did God's voice sound like when you were driving the car and you heard that say, pray for this? What, what did it sound like? Was it an audible voice? Or was it just some spontaneous thought that just kind of, boop, landed on your mind and there it is? Oh, I should pray for that person. Where did that come from? Is he in the back seat? So most of us would say that God's voice comes as just spontaneous thoughts like that. So Dr. Verkler, in his research, his, you know, his uh, time with God, discovered that most spirit-level communication is received as spontaneous thoughts, impressions, feelings, visions. So when we listen for God's voice, we should be listening for that flow of spontaneous thoughts. You know, when I'm praying for someone, you know, sometimes I'll get a picture 
You know, I might get a single word. I personally, I, I personally don't hear, Glenn, right now, I want you to turn left to the next light. So you're going to see a guy in a green shirt with a red hat. And you're going to go tell him that, uh, uh, that uh, God does love him and uh, he is going to, uh, he's going to make it through this trial, which is his wife is trying to divorce him. And all. Glenn, that guy. Okay. The rest of it, I don't know. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I get, you know, I'll get, I'll see a picture, I'll see a single word, but often I'll get what I can only dis- describe as a, an impression or a, a quickening. You know, just an impression that I'm supposed to pray for that one. And a good example actually was a couple of weeks ago. I dropped in on a new dog groomer because I need a dog groomer. And uh, so I was talking to this young guy, and uh, he started telling me that, yeah, he's, it's been hard for him recently because he was in a motorcycle accident. He'd hurt his hand, and his hand just wasn't the way it used to be yet. And uh, there was no voice told me, pray for him, right? It was nothing like that. It was just like a, uh, and I knew, oh, I need to pray for the. I didn't feel like praying for him, let me just be honest with you. I had other things to do, and, you know, and I didn't feel all super spiritual or anything. Um, but I had that impression, that quickening. And so, um, so, I, so I, okay, can I pray for you? I'm a Christian. I love to see people get healed. And, you know, so, oh, yeah, okay, can I hold your hand? Can I, the, other, the hurt hand? Yes, yeah, so he holds the hand out. I take his hand. As I touch his hand, I realize this guy's hand is, like, freezing cold. Like, this is like an icicle. This is weird, but okay, whatever. And so I pray for him, and I ask him, so how's it, is, there, is there any difference? Do you feel any difference in your, in your pain level? And he tells me, when you touched my hand, it became freezing cold like I never felt that before, and the pain is going away. And I'm like, what? That's interesting. Because I, I, I noticed it. I noticed his hand is cold. But there was nothing that related me to saying that there wasn't one millisecond before I touched it. I mean, it was the weirdest thing. And then the pain starts to go away in his hand. And, okay, this is real quick here. This hand here, this is my right hand. It was his right hand too, by the way. This hand is messed up. Okay, and again, I'll get my violin. I, I did something stupid a year and a bit ago and had to have surgery. And then, so this hand is in a lot of pain, and I can't, this finger doesn't really. And this guy, God is saying, pray for this guy with a hand problem. Do you see the disconnect? But see, that's, God doesn't care about that. This, this is kind of an aside here, but God doesn't care about that right? We don't understand everything of how God works or whatever like that. Would I like my hand to be perfect again? Yeah, that'd be great. It's not. It's his hand. It seemed to be. Okay. All right. Moving on. That's just for somebody. I don't know. So the point of this message, though, is you can hear God's voice. Practice these keys because practice makes permanent. Thank you. Permanent. But I know some of you, one of you, maybe just one, is sitting out there and you're saying to yourself or to God or whomever, I can't hear God's voice. You know what? I tried it once. Didn't work. Can't hear God's voice. So, and, 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 you know, and, and it's not fair either because that guy hears God's voice. I don't hear God's Why? Is he better than me? No, he's not, by the way. How come he hears? How come I don't? You know, there's, there's, there can be all sorts of reasons why we might not hear or feel like we're not hearing God's voice. And we touched on some already, sin, offense, unforgiveness. We touched on those, and those can seriously affect our hearing. Sometimes, sometimes you might actually feel like, you know what? This is like I'm walking through 
a desert. And again, I don't know why you're walking through a desert or I'm walking through a desert, but it's a desert, so keep walking and get to the other side, right? Get through it. And, and you know, there may be seasons where I could hear his voice. Now I'm finding it difficult. Well, keep pressing in, right? Keep pressing into God. Just keep, keep doing what you know to do, right? Keep pressing in. The other reason, though, that you might not be hearing God's voice is that maybe probably you haven't practiced these keys enough. And you're getting distracted. Or you're not discerning God's voice. Have you ever been in a place where someone is, Glenn, I need you to unload the dishwasher. Glenn, unload the dishwasher. Glenn, I'll unload. I'm sorry, did you say something? That's not none of you, Okay. See, God is talking to you. Just say this after me. God is talking to me. me. Yes, so keep practicing. How's our time? Whoa, we're running out of time. So we've got to move on here. But you know what? When you hear someone start a sentence with, I don't want to offend you, but. What's, What's coming next? Hmm. All right, well, keeping that in mind, I don't want to take you down a rabbit trail, but while you continue to practice these keys, okay, we're learning, we're practicing, we're still, but you can also take a lesson from a shoe company and just do it, right? Spend time practicing, you know, practice in prayer, wait on the Lord, do these things, but pray for others. You know, a specific word, can give you direction, it can increase your faith, and can increase the person you're praying for faith, it can increase his faith, and that's true, and that's good. But you don't need a supernatural word from God to pray for somebody. Right? Can I get an amen there? Right? Just do it. Does God want people to be sick, suffering, in pain? No. No! So when you see someone in that situation... You can most often usually use that as your permission and authority to pray, okay? So that's just a little rabbit trail there. I don't hear God's voice, so I can't pray for anyone. No, no, no. It doesn't work that way, right? Key number four is journaling. Write down the flow of your thoughts and pictures, of the thoughts and pictures that God shows you. Now, this doesn't mean once and done, okay, right? I got my journal. I wrote in it once and, whew, got that done. No, you gotta, you got you know, you got to do this every day. This page. Habakkuk 2.2, it said, record, God said this, record the vision, inscribe it on tablets. And if you search Scripture for this idea... This is God. Write down what I'm going to say. Right? It's all over. It's all through the Bible, right? You find all sorts of examples. The exercise of writing down what God is saying. We call that journaling. A journal helps you to better discern God's spontaneous flow. Right? You write what you're seeing. You can go back afterwards. You can weigh it. Glenn, get ice cream. Okay? Glenn, I want you to start a ministry doing this. That's interesting. That's probably not God. Right? So you can discern what you write, and the Holy Spirit will help you with that too. Doubt, again, we talked about doubt. Doubt can get in the way, but work through it. Press through your doubts. It's a biblical concept. Just do it. Get out your notebook. Get your pen. Turn your attention to God. Now, this is Glenn's key to journaling, and I kind of started there a moment ago. It means Glenn's Glenn's key to journaling is that you've got to make yourself start somewhere, right? Here's a secret. I hate making phone calls, you know, to to call, uh, you know, Peter down there and ask him how he's doing or to, to, you know, have coffee with Ari. I hate making that. Just to pick up the phone... Are you available on Tuesday? That's the hardest thing for me to do in my life. But once I'm on the phone talking to the person or we're in the coffee shop, 
I can talk for hours. Glenn, I need to go. Glenn, I need to go. I get kids at home. Oh, okay. You know, that's easy. But see, I got to start somewhere. I got to pick up the phone. And journaling is the same. Once I start, often it's like, oh, I got things to do. Right? It just keeps going. And you're going to be the same way. You just got to start. You got to find. And you got to make it easy for yourself. Oh, I should write this down. Where's my notebook? Oh, well, maybe I'll remember to write it down later. See, uh -uh, that doesn't work, does it? You, You might need four notebooks. You got one in your quiet place. You got one in your bedroom. Maybe just one by your easy chair. Maybe you got one in the bathroom. I don't know. Um, so, and, and pens. Okay, you got to have a pen with it. Otherwise, we're back where we started from. Make it easy for you, and just get starting. So, closing here, the Dr. Verkler's four keys. One was stillness, quiet yourself. Two. Vision. Look for vision as you pray. Expect to hear from God. Three, recognize God's voice as spontaneous thoughts. Four, journaling. It's a matter of learning how to recognize the language of the Spirit. And it can be, be you know, a little different for, for each, each one of us as we go through this. Now, I didn't mean to rush there. Okay, I did. I meant to rush a little bit there at the end because I just I wanted to have a little bit of time here. What I, wanted, I want us to take a few minutes and, uh, and just give these keys a, a tryout right here while we're still all here together, you know? So, you know, if you're, if you're born again, if you're walking in right relationship with God, you can be confident that God will speak to you. You can hear his voice. Now, that's right from the notes, okay? That's right from the notes. Uh, as I was thinking about that, though, you might be here and you're not in a right relationship with God this morning. The cool thing is you can still hear God's voice. I just want, I don't want you to turn yourself off and say, well, you know, I'm not sure about this God stuff yet. And so I think I'll skip this exercise. No, I want you to participate. If you're here and you don't have that relationship, I want you to participate. You know, in the Bible, there's all sorts of examples. You know, there's this guy named Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament. He gets all these dreams. God's giving him these dreams. Now, he doesn't know what they mean, but God's giving it to him, right? Or there's, or there's Paul, before he was called Paul in the New Testament, they called him Saul, right? And so Jesus knocked him off his horse or his donkey or whatever he was riding, and he hears God's voice. This is an audible voice that he's hearing. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul was not a, you know, he was not a Christian at that time. Right? Dude, turn to your neighbor and say, no, he wasn't a Christian at that time. Right, right. So, so you can hear God's voice. And I don't know, that was a lot of time there, but I think that's for somebody here this morning. So stick with me. So right now, I want you to put your, just put yourself in a posture to receive from God this morning. Okay, so that, that might mean you close your eyes. You don't have to, but you might want to close your eyes. You might want to hold your hands out. Just, you know, it's not because God's going to, yeah! It's because it's a posture of receiving, right? If I'm going to give you a gift, you're going to hold your hands out, right? And then we're going to steal our thoughts and our emotions. And begin to listen for that flow. I'm just going to pray just while you're sitting there. Lord, I thank you that each one of us has the ability to hear your voice. You created us, God, to hear your voice. You put that in us. You put that in in our spirits. Your word says that your sheep hear your voice. So I invite you, Holy Spirit, I ask you to come right now. And I thank you for speaking to your people, to your sons and daughters this morning. God, I ask you to activate and increase right now all over this room. Activate and increase the ability to hear your voice, Lord. 
Help us to learn better how to discern which voice is yours, Lord, even in this very moment right now. And Lord, in Jesus' name, I break the bondage of the Christian mindset that says I can't hear God. God doesn't talk to people today. I break that in this room in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, for your presence, your thoughts, your spontaneous thoughts, impressions, pictures. I thank you for it. Just release it right now, Lord, all over this room, God. As you fix your eyes or your heart on Jesus, just begin to expect to hear from him right now. Thank you, Lord. So just with, a, uh, just with a show of hands, how many of you felt like you were hearing God's voice just now, that you felt that God was showing you something, an impression, a word, a little vision, something in, that you felt God was showing you? Yeah, that's awesome. Now how many of you, maybe that, you've, you've, that was like the first time that you really thought you heard God's voice like that? Is there anyone who would say that this morning? Thank you, Lord. All right, so we have four steps. What was step number four? Journaling. So consider taking a moment. You can do it right now while you're sitting there or later this afternoon. Write down what you felt like God was showing you just, just now in this moment. And you know most of you have got smartphones. You've got to program on there somewhere that you can take notes on so you can just write that down <clears throat> all right well let's let's uh, let's just close in prayer here father god i thank you for what you're doing in your people lord i thank you for new revelation for new ability to hear your voice Lord, I thank you for this, this time that we've had to rest in your presence and to hear from you and, Lord, to, uh, to visit with the saints, to fellowship with one another, God. We just thank you for the great blessings that, that you pour out on us, Lord. And I just pray your hand upon each one of us. An amazing day today, an amazing week, Lord, in Jesus' name.